Welcome to Self Principle. As always, I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. Now, today's topic is about the new obesity medications that have come on the market. Specifically, we're talking about GLP-1 agonists. And what are the safety concerns that you really want to know about? So before we dive into the data around the safety concerns, let's explain a little bit about how sugar in your body is handled and what are those key players. As you know, a lot of weight loss drugs that are coming out are really drugs that were initially designed for diabetes and the higher dosing are showing that they can also be used for reducing your appetite going on. So when we look at sugar balance inside our body, you know, it's this really complex dance that involves a number of key players. Those key players are things like insulin, glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1, and that's the topic of today, um, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, GIP. Now, not only do we have GLP-1 agonists, we also now have dual agonists, which means they're acting through two mechanisms. There are GLP-1 and GIP agonists going on. And in the pipelines, there are drugs that are looking at triple agonists, which means there'll be GLP-1, GIP, and amylin agonists going on. So we'll get into that a little bit. And then there were some other stuff like DPP-4s, which are dipeptidyl peptide 4 uh, inhibitors going on that can actually increase the levels of GLP-1 in the body. So let's explain a little bit of each one of these and then dive into the safety data. So when we look at our pancreas, our pancreatic beta cells, those are what produce insulin and amylin. And insulin and amylin, they actually get secreted together. Now, amylin can actually affect your sugar balance through lots of things. So it can slow down how quickly food goes from your stomach to your intestines. So we call that gastric emptying. It can also decrease glucagon release. Remember, glucagon will take and break down sugar out of your liver, put it into the bloodstream going on. So it will decrease that. And amylin can also reduce hunger. This all makes amylin an interesting target in terms of increasing it when it comes to weight loss medications going on. Then let's go on to looking at the GLP ones. So your L cells of the small intestine, that's what produces the glucagon like peptide one or GLP ones. Now, GLP ones, what's interesting and in my mind a little bit concerning is they don't just act where you want them to be. In other words, they're not just acting on the pancreas alone. So they act in a number of tissues, such as pancreatic beta cells, pancreatic ducts in the gastric mucosa or stomach mucosa, in the kidney, in the heart, in the skin, in the immune cells, in the hypothalamus. Now, GLP-1 has several functions. So one, it can actually stimulate the release of insulin going on, and that's dependent on how much sugar there's in the bloodstream. It can decrease how fast food goes out of your stomach. So in other words, it will decrease gastric emptying. It can also prevent inappropriate glucagon release. Remember, glucagon is increasing sugars inside the blood. So you don't want extra sugar in the blood, so it can do that. And like amylin, it's going to go ahead and decrease your appetite. So now you understand how GLP-1s work. They work on the stomach by decreasing gastric emptying. They can reduce hunger by acting on the hypothalamus going on. And they can also work to not let glucagon uh, release extra sugars, and they will go ahead and lower the sugar floating around by causing insulin release. Now, with GIP, which is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, GIP is actually made from K cells of the small intestine going on. And GIP binds to GIP receptors that are found in the pancreas, both beta and alpha cells, that are found in the visceral and adipose tissue, in the bone, and in the heart. And GIP actually gets secreted along with GLP-1, and together they both stimulate insulin secretion. But the one key difference between GLP-1s and GIP is GIP does not affect gastric emptying. Now, this is a lot of information to note, but why is it important for you guys to know this background is because these are the new drugs that are either already out or in the pipeline to come out that are looking at weight loss. The thing that you have to understand is they're not just only acting on weight loss. They're actually acting on a number of different organs. And some of those effects, we still don't know yet.
Okay, with DPP-4s, which was dipeptidyl peptidase 4, this is the enzyme that's found on the surface of most cells, and it activates, I'm sorry, it deactivates a number of bioactive molecules such as GLP and GIP. So DPP-4 inhibitors would then increase your GLP-1 and your GIP going on. That's why we have DPP inhibitors going on. So the new drugs that are out for obesity specifically target each one of these going on. And in a new study that was published in the Diabetes Care Journal, what the researchers were looking at was they wanted to see what is the risk of GLP-1 specifically around thyroid cancer. As you know, when the studies were released, there were some animal models suggesting a small risk. The question is, what happens when we start to look at population data? However, this study was looking at data collection going on from 2006 to 2018. And at that point in time, we didn't have the new drugs like Vigovi, like Saxenda, etc. going on. So the actual challenge is, is this data doesn't really include the significantly higher dosing of the GLP-1 drugs going on, but it gives us an idea. Now, in the study, they included 3.7 million folks who all had, by the way, type 2 diabetes, and 4,466 of them, they developed thyroid cancer during the study. Now, after they excluded the patients with a history of thyroid cancer, it left them with 2,562 adults who had cancer going on. So here's what you want to know. The risk, the overall risk of thyroid cancer with GLP-1s is very small. But the question is, how does it compare to the general population? So the overall risk, once again, general population, extremely small. With this, remember, it was about 4,466 patients out of 3.7 million. Okay. So then when we go into talking about the risk going on in this particular data analysis, what they found was that patients who were currently using GLP-1 receptors, they had a 46% higher risk of thyroid cancer than those who were not using it. Now, if patients had used GLP-1 agonists for about one to three years, they had a 58% higher risk of thyroid cancer than patients who were not using it. And at three years, there was about a 36% higher risk. So even though 58 and 36 is a significant number, keep in mind that the overall number is low. But what is the bottom line? The bottom line here is the risk is not zero. So both doctors and patients need to be aware of the potential risks that come with these new weight loss drugs. In the past, the last three weight loss drugs we've had got pulled off the market for one reason or another because they increase the risk for cancer, for suicide, or for damaging heart valves going on. So medications are not a magic bullet. Every day I have patients come to my office and they're not looking to eat better. They're not looking to exercise more. They're just looking for a drug and hoping the drug would change their overall weight and magically fix everything. It doesn't. Number two is when we start you on a weight loss drug, you are on that weight loss drug for life. It's not something that we can stop. The second we stop it, we stop the chemical signal, the appetite comes right back. The way to be successful is to be practicing lifestyle medicine already. Work on that and use the drugs as an adjunct, as an add-on, not as the sole thing that's going to get you through it. As always, thank you so much for watching this episode. If you have questions or topics or anything you want to know about, drop it in the comments below and I'll be sure to address it next time. Other than that, thank you so much for your support. Don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, share this with your friends and colleagues and I'll see you guys next time.